Welcome back to Speak About the Spark, brought to you by createschool.ie. Over the past few episodes, we've been hearing from different guests from the field of creative arts, gaining an insight into their process and picking up some useful hints and tips that you and I can use in our own creativity. At Create School, we deliver workshops in movie making, stop motion animation, podcasting and songwriting, and have been delivering these workshops for near to 20 years. If you'd like to get in touch with suggestions and thoughts, please find us at Create School on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and Instagram or email us at info at createschool.ie. For links to the guests and their work or anything else mentioned in the series, go to createschool.ie forward slash spark. In this week's episode, Peter talks to Frank Kearns. Frank is the guitarist and founding member of the band Cactus World News. He started Ireland's first rock school. He's a producer, musician and music educator. Frank tells us what he thinks is important in being an artist and teacher and his thoughts on using technology in the creative process. Enjoy. Hello and welcome. I'm here today with Frank Kearns. Tell us who you are, Frank. Tell us a little bit about you. Well, Frank Kearns, I talk about myself in third party here. <laughs> uh, he's, he's a good blog. He's a great guy. He's a really good guy. He, um, he started off in Mount Temple mm-hmm. uh, back in the 70s in a band called Frankie Corpse and the Undertakers. Uh, good mates with another band called Feedback, which then became U2. Mm-hmm. And uh, Frankie Corpse and the Undertakers had a lead singer called Neil McCormack, who wrote a book called Killing Bono, who was made it. You've seen the film, movie. yeah, yeah. Guy, uh, David Fennelly, actor who played me in that movie. Uh-huh. Um, I was a guitar player, in, even though it was called Frankie Corpse and the Undertakers, so I wasn't a singer, I was a guitar player. So basically, that's that was the kind of early period of me uh, starting off. Then I formed... Uh, the Mr. Men, and then we had Blue Russia, and then I formed Cactus World News with Owen McAvoy in the early 80s, about 84. And uh, we got a big record deal with MCA Records, Tour of the World, sold over a quarter million albums, and um, then in 1992, um, we just moved on we just we had to stop for medical reasons mm-hmm. jeez that's uh, uh yeah, yeah got so got really sick of each other uh, <laughs> but anyway uh, is that no, a condition <laughs> yeah no banditis uh, like it, there were some really big highlights there uh, mm-hmm. Joey Ramon coming backstage in the Ritz Ritz uh, club in New York telling me that uh you know, the band was one of his favourite bands and years later it was one of his favourite songs. And... Because they were a real inspiration. You had a Ramones tribute band, didn't oh, you? Oh, yeah. The first, the world's first ever Ramones tribute band. Wow. It was called The Fast. Yeah. Myself and Stephen Ryan, who was in Stars of Heaven, uh-huh. uh, on bass, and uh, Dave Borden, who sadly left us a couple of months ago, and... Um, uh, I think Eric Briggs was actually on drums. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, we just played Ramon songs, and I had a Johnny Ramon fixation. And yeah. I think he's one of the best guitar players ever was. Yeah. It's funny thing about the Ramones is people, when they look at it, they think it's very simple. And then they try to play it, and they realize, hold on a second here. Yeah. Um, so uh, Ramones were fantastically inspirational to me. And um, Lou Reed. Uh, if you go on YouTube, type in Lou Reed, Cactus World News, you'll see Lou Reed talking about, uh, years later, being one of his favourite songs too. Wow. That's um, mind-blowing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then, um, so like that was all, we were not that amazingly popular in Ireland, but, you know, other yeah. places, including the Philippines, uh-huh. which is very uh, interesting because I never realised that we were uh, popular in Manila and the new way of seeing over there is massive and uh, it's only many years later to use the pun that I found out that in actual fact the band was very popular and sold a lot of records over there and tell us this is all pre-internet days we didn't know anything like that 
Yeah, but speaking of pre-internet days, you learned Ramon's songs. See, you would have had to learn them by ear because I take mm. it there wouldn't have been published music even. No. There's no internet. That was literally trying to figure out a song on a turntable. Well, literally what happened... From a turntable. Yeah, it was... I, myself and Dave Evans, who later became The Edge, we were sitting in the library and I was, you know, he knew I was a Ramones fan and I was trying to get the chords to... Um, you know, Pinhead and a few other those, and I couldn't understand. I I saw photographs. Chalky Davis took some definitive photographs of uh, Ramones, brilliant <laughs> photographer Chalky Davis, and uh, I saw Johnny hold this weird looking chord. I didn't realize it was a bar A, but uh, <laughs> a weird looking chord. And I, I remember saying to the Edge, you know, it's really, you know, how does he? How did, how did he get that sound? Because I, I'm trying to sound and I can't quite get it. You know, and I remember saying to him, you know, it's almost like there's like an echo or something behind a guitar yeah. of how he's playing it. And I remember his eyes lit up because then... Yeah, yeah. now what happened know, there? Echo, yeah. <laughs> echo, that's interesting. But what I was describing was double tracking. Right, yeah. Which I had no idea what that how was. How would you, though? No. I mean, yeah. And But, so, like, I, I'm in, you know... Uh, Goodwin's music store and I'm playing the guitar and, or Pat Dolan up in Bowman actually whereas I, I bought a lot of gear there and I'd be playing the guitar and think, but it doesn't sound like the record why you know uh-huh. so it's this huge mystery you know now people just go on Google and yeah, just, yeah. but back then it was you know how did you solve it? Um, well basically it was only when I started doing recording myself and I started to listen like we started with Tim Martin uh, Phil Lynn produced Blue Russia one of the Blue Russia songs and um, they were they showed us about doing uh, doing overdubs which I had no idea what it was obviously it was only a kid mm-hmm. uh, and then I realised the sound this is a great sound that's amazing yeah, yeah. and yeah, the penny right. drops <laughs> the penny drops and you kind of go it's like Santa Claus yeah yeah <laughs> I remember getting thrown out of a music shop once for memorising lyrics I was in there at lunchtime yeah. uh, memorising chords rather because yeah. it's the only way to do it this oh, is free yeah, yeah. yeah. G, C and yeah. they were uh, that's I have it. to go son. Um, tell us then uh, would you regard yourself Frank as a creative person well, look basically the essence of who I am has been based around creativity because I had to create my own work basically right mm-hmm. from the beginning um, I did when I left school had a, like a small little sort of trip into electrician land, but I, I, that wasn't for me. And um, but I, I basically had to sort of you know uh, create things out of nothing to try and live, you know, sure. in in an area that I wanted to live, which was music. And you know, in the early nineties, uh, <clears throat> I started you know the country's first rock school out in Hope. Uh, it was called Salt Rock School. And Still then, going. Yeah, it's changed its name though. We, I moved it then down to Sutton. I uh, got a premises there, so it's Frank Kern's Rock School now. But um, that rock school has been basically in the centre of my life since 1992, three. And um, so, like, the creativity, my creativity is focused around, yeah, doing my own songs and collaborations with, say, Steve Kilby from the church. And. Um, of different people, self included, mm-hmm. but just uh, so it's been around that the creativity, my own creativity, did my solo stuff and all that, and then watching you know 10 to 15, 16 year age uh, people writing their own songs and developing them up into proper you know expressions of who they are. So the creativity uh, has been central to my life, really professionally and emotionally and spiritually it's it's there you know it's mm. always been there but would you say it's uh, your education then so when you're it feeds into how you educate so for example you're teaching non-formally in the rock school so you'd be encouraging people to be creative showing them know, chord progressions or some music theory but not in the formal context right so it's interesting to see how that relays so you're it, you're like a conduit or a filter it's going through you and going into other people but you're also getting 
a buzz or a creative spark from... Yeah, I get loads back from yeah, people it's interesting. where you teach me. It's got to be a cycle where they're teaching you, you're teaching them. Sure. It's not so much teaching, it's more facilitating. It's good. I mean, when I, when I started off, right, no one can teach songwriting, by the way. You can just facilitate it and give your experience and arrangements and stuff and help people mold things to craft. There is a craft of songwriting, but it's like you have to be doing it, you have to be creative, and then somebody who has experience goes, well, maybe it doesn't need a middle eight, maybe you just do another chorus, or maybe we're getting a little bit bored here, we do need sure. a middle eight. Like, my whole philosophy really is, you know, when I started off uh, teaching guitar, my first student was Larry, uh, drummer in U2, uh, and that's what made me think, well, he said I should do his teaching, I didn't want to do teaching, but I, I kind of investigated a bit more, and a lot of locals were coming around in pre-internet days, in the early 90s, asking me to show them this and show them that. So then I started this workshop thing with people getting together to write songs and then that developed up in individual lessons and I really enjoyed it but I I investigated how people were being taught and you know I'd ask friends you know what instrument did you learn oh piano and you still no and I'd say 85% of people said they hated their lessons hated them mm. and I'd say mo I I would say if you walk down the street here today and ask people what did they learn with your kids, oh, piano, guitar, and you still play, no, I gave it up, it's just boring, scales all the time. And then it got me to think, well, hold on, if I want to learn how to drive a car, I want to call the school of motoring, I want to go in, I'm expecting to sit in the car, put the gear in first, and move off, and then have the guy tell me now, press your foot down, okay, pull the gear back. But formal music education, that I saw and still exists to this day is the guy the guy going to you saying, okay, now you want to drive a car? Fine. Now, here's a sump. I want you to drain the oil from the sump. Now, this is how the cavalry <laughs> converter works. And the pistons into, into space with this. And then we have the oil pump, which is going, you kind of go, sorry, mate, did I, did I say I want to be a mechanic? Okay, yeah, it's I don't a want analogy, to be a mechanic. Yeah. I just want to drive a bloody yeah. car. So the thing is, it's handy to know how to change the light bulb, handy to know how to change the oil and all that. But it's not necessary, not necessary. Um, however, what I am very much into knowledge, you know, understanding theory of music and understanding all the basics, I'm very much into that. But it's, my philosophy is to do it the other way around. It's like get people into playing the drums um, playing the guitar, get their favorite songs going. Don't start, don't uh, begin a song and finish it. Start about three or four songs and just keep the thing going. And then you keep a list of the, so the chords you want people to learn because you're basically, well, philosophy of the rock school is, is to design the course around the individual. So if they're into Led Zeppelin, ACDC, and all that, I know I'm going to have to head towards, you know, uh, at some stage showing them. Um, how to do power chords, bar chords, and you know, if you want to do a lead guitar, you need to do a few pentatonic scales and stuff. I know I need to get there, but I start off doing Green Day and then I start off doing yeah. this stuff. So one size doesn't fit all, but it's interesting on two fronts there. One is I, I, I completely get what you're saying um, about the education and formal education, and it is for some people, some people do like it, but. I was at a conference in the UK about 10 years ago, a music conference, and music educators conference, actually. It was yeah. really interesting. And they had a guy got up and presented. He was involved in Paul McCartney's university, and he had a graph that showed, which I can't remember accurately, but it was interesting and quite profound because it had a graph that showed the age in Western countries mm. that people get involved in music. So by the age of 10 or 11, there was a yeah. massive percentage of kids that were trying music and then the graph fell sharply by the time they were 14 15 16 yeah. that were gone forever from yeah. music and from whatever experience because it isn't a one size fits all you can't just say you must learn formally and do your scales and then we'll start and you learn these set pieces and you do your grades that's for some people but the majority of people i would say would respond more to that more organic way of playing we go look i just heard this song on the radio blew me away how do i play that 
Well, I think that's what inspired you. Developing the ear is the most important thing. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, when I was, people, my contemporaries, we didn't have universities to go to to learn music and, mm. you know, uh, or to learn about, you know, writing songs or to do sound engineering. There was none of that. Yeah. We had to, like, I learned from Tim Martin, who was Ireland's greatest sound engineer. And um, I, I just learned along the way is the Greek word paxos, learn by doing. So I, you know, I never wanted to personally, uh, you know, I got into music because I loved the music that I loved and I wanted to play more of that. I didn't want to play a bit of this and a bit of that and then a bit of this and a bit of that. I wanted to do, just do the music I liked. Yeah. And so when I started teaching and I, I teach with that philosophy of the individual saying, you know, what's the music you like? Let's do this. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and, you know, there will be maybe 2% of people who might want to go in a classical direction at some stage. And it'd be important for them to learn how to read music and to, you know, to, to know how to be very proficient so that they can perform what the conductor and the, you know, the old Mozart and all the great classics, so they can perform that work, right? But that's not really creative work. It's, it's, you're just basically performing, you're functional performing a piece of work that somebody has already written 100 years ago. So what I'm talking about is actually playing stuff that comes from your heart, that comes from an, a point of view in your body that it needs to be expressed. Mm-hmm. And you need the tools, you need the tools, there could be chords. Uh, a lot of bands we know, a lot of singers, songwriters, they write the best songs in their early part of the career. And after that, it's just downhill. You because? Know, and they write because there's less options. Yeah, because they true. have basic chords and they go, well, I have to play do something with this. Mm. So it's not like, oh, I'll do an A minor, seven tier, and I'll, you know, modulate then up to a C, <laughs> ninth. And the, yeah. It's none of that, or a bit of jazz here and a bit of rock and roll. It's, it's very defined due to the fact that they have no options other than to stay with what they know. And therefore, that's why in Irish rock in the 80s, because we, there was no multiculturalism in Ireland back in the 80s, so it was a very definitive sound, very singular, very um, focused. Yeah. Because that's, that's who we were, you know? Yeah. And that's why it's very distinctive. But, you know, and, and um, so I think limiting yourself is a good thing in terms of the equipment you use, the amount of guitars you have, the effects you have, just limit it all down and then start there. It's great advice because if you buy a, a, a tablet, at iPhone or whatever, and you've got GarageBand, which is brilliant. Like, it's a great creative option. Yeah, they're great tools. But there's so much on there. And yeah. so what happens all of a sudden, I think you can very easily fill up 24 tracks because you can. Yeah. Sometimes limiting yourself, it's interesting when you go back yeah. to what people did. And also, I think one of the great... Uh, learning well the college that I went to was uh, the college of sitting over an engineer or a producer's shoulder and yeah. what are you doing how does that work yeah. and I think a lot of younger people probably miss that because you're doing it at home and if you're just learning off YouTube which can be a great resource yeah. but if you're just learning there's no there's no bounce there's no response you can't asked why are you doing that you have to send an email or type a comment or do whatever I think sometimes that's where a studio for example mm. had had and has a real role to play but now there's so few and they're so expensive to go to a good yeah. studio uh, you miss that so going with your mates is fine and people that record but sometimes to go in part of what you're paying for is the experience of the Tim Martin or well, whoever. Well, everyone has to learn that. Like, I remember when I don't yeah. have Salt Studio. I have this studio. I don't have this. The I don't offer commercial recording anymore because, you know, when people stopped paying for music, the record companies went bust. The money wasn't flowing anymore. Yeah. So I couldn't, you know, I couldn't run this commercial studio. But uh, what used to happen uh, towards the end, 2010, 2011, is a guy would ask me for a quote for, to do an album. I'd uh, give him the amount of money it will cost and uh, he'd come back and he'd laugh and say God, you know you yeah. must be joking me you know and I'd say it's fine you, sure. you can do whatever you have to do so they did what you know young musicians who are arrogant do they go 
he's an asshole, you know, yeah. and that's that's the right. That's what you, they should, should be doing. It's, it's it's like you're taking control. So they go up to cabin, they rent a house for two weeks, and their mate Bob has a has a pro tool set up, and uh, he's doing a little course in town, so he knows everything about the engineering. So they're all up there, have a few beers every day, and you know. It's only going to cost them maybe twenty percent of what I charge would charge. Yeah. So they're all having great fun. They're writing some great music and good performances and all that. Then they come back down after two weeks out in Cavan, and they they're sitting in their front room and they're putting on the, you know, the CD, the rough CD in the mix, and then the drummer goes, "Oh, can you get that echo off the snare," and the engineer goes, "Uh, no, that was the room it was recording." Yeah. What? Can't get the echo off the snare? Yeah. And then the bass player goes, That sounds real honky. Can you stop like can we yeah. get a better sound? Well uh no. <laughs> and then the guitar player is like why do I sound distant? Like, can I can hear the drums in my So then the penny drops, they sort of realise, hold on, there's a bit more to this. And then they come back to me and say, Listen, could you mix this? And I have to say no, because yeah. I can't. I can't put my name to something like that. It's recorded badly. So it took me about 20 years to learn how to listen myself. I, wow. I couldn't, like Chris Kimsey, Rolling mm-hmm. Stones producer, produced Cactus World News. Um, he taught me a lot, by, not by what he said, but what he did. And, you know, he community listened to a room and he knew the sound of the room before anything was hit. Wow. You're like, and I was fascinated with this. I could never understand acoustics. I couldn't get my head around it because I'd have my two Vox amps up to 10. I'd be playing my guitar and my ears were hearing the sound I wanted to hear. Yeah. And I was trying to turn the knobs and all that to try and get that sound. And then I thought I heard the sound, I put the mics up, but when we go into the control room, it would never be the same. That's because there's apparent sound and actual sound. So in the control room, it was what the mic was actually picking up which was not my guitar amp at all. It was my guitar amp sound, plus the sound of my guitar amp in the room. Sure, the ambience. Uh, yeah. yeah, but yeah. It's, it's hard to get your head around that, yeah. that what you think you're hearing is not actually what you're hearing. And also, I think that's interesting, you're talking about a producer like Chris Kimsey, a lot of younger people might not know who he is, but there's a lot of good producers around. Yeah. Right? And they they have their, their Tattoo sound. Tattoo you, the Rolling Stones. Great album. A killing killing joke. Yeah, yeah did yeah. them as well. Yeah. Uh, but um, what the, what I'm saying, I suppose, is that one of the reasons you'd go and you'd get a producer necessarily, one of the things they would do is help you with arrangement, say. Yeah. Production values. Also, just you're the guitarist and you know how your guitar sounds. Mm. And then the drummer knows how his drum sounds. But a lot of people aren't necessarily used to listening together and knowing how it should sound when it's blended. And that's part of what a good producer and a good engineer will do, yeah. is know how to, how to marry a song. One of the best producers is Jimmy Page. Wow, I didn't know he actually produced. Oh, amazing producer. Did he? You listen to the Zeppelin albums. I put them on in a rock school, yeah. right? They sound fresh every time, every time. If you listen to... Well, the Rage has had great engineers too, great studios. Yeah, yeah, but the arrangements. Okay, fair point, yeah. So so he'll mix a Telecaster and the left speaker with a Gibson Les Paul and the right speaker. Okay. There's no competition for the frequencies. Everything has its own little spot. And in terms of the reverb, the picture, the sonic picture, the, the, lands, the acoustic landscape you're listening to, how he positions the sounds in the mix... You know, like in a painting, you, you know, stuff in the foreground is sharper, sure. stuff in the background is, is duller. You know, inexperienced engineers, producers that make everything sharp, make everything up front, bright and all that, you just don't know what you're listening to. Yeah. But people who know how, how art works in terms of the depth and all that, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't know that. No, I, I, I just, it's only through studying those records. So you, by listening to Led Zeppelin, you could actually learn quite a lot just listening to it yeah. um, and really listen to it. And then you have to be kind of shown how to listen as well. That's the thing. That's true. So you have to, like a lot of records that recorded in the last 10, 20 years on Joe's laptop up in his you know, mate's house, they won't be listened to ever again because they sound horrible. 
but a lot of the records that record in decent studios with good you know musicians and great songs they're going to be listened to forever hmm. why well i think i think part of the creative process is also having a value on other creatives and a good producer is a creative person oh, a totally. good engineer is a creative person so sometimes it's really interesting uh, within, if we're talking about being creative people, is to find other people in your field who are better than you. Yeah. Uh, I remember a great quote, uh, you should always make sure you're the dumbest person in the room. Oh, that's, that's, if, really, that's if, a really good piece of advice. It is. You know, when you go in somewhere and you're learning all the time and you're saying, and you get good musicians, the best you can find, who are sympathetic and to what you're doing, and, and a, a producer and an engineer and yes it's going to cost you more but you'll learn a lot and when I was in a little band starting off we used to every year we saved up once a year and we'd do two days in the studio and it was the best knowledge yeah, you'd ever you'd learn so much learn loads and then you go home and practice that on a four track or whatever you're doing but make sure and ask questions and I mean the thing is uh, is that just being creative like you say if you're in a nine to five job you get a regular salary and you're just having a doodle in the evenings with music and you're just doing sure. it for your own enjoyment. That's cool because you have that money uh, to fall back on, mm -hmm. regular income, and also you're doing it for the pure love of it. If you're doing it professionally, it's, it's a challenge because you, you've got all these other added things like business. You've got to make, you've got to make, your, make a living, you know, and they're precious. Now, I'll tell you what, uh, what I've noticed 30 years of teaching is teachers of music have to be very careful to look after themselves and by that i mean they have to be careful not to burn out and not do too many lessons not do too much teaching uh, that's one of the things in rock school is we make sure that people don't work beyond a certain amount of students because if you overdo it you know and try to get more money in because you want to teach more people and all that. What happens is you build up a resentment, mm. not Good only point. of the students, but of everything. Because unconsciously, you may not realize it, but unconsciously, unconsciously you, you're, you, you're basically giving all the time you know, to, to the student. You're giving everything, you're constantly giving, you're not getting, you don't feel like you're getting anything for yourself, like in terms of mm. your own creative stuff. You're just, working on someone else's dream, working on making their creativity happen. So that's okay, but you need to balance that with your own creativity. Good point. That was actually the second thing I was going to say earlier on. I, I, I got distracted, but yeah, absolutely, because teaching's great, but it's not for everyone. And teaching, again, informally is interesting because a lot yeah. of the research, it's coming on stream now that people are, are acknowledging and and initiatives like Creative Ireland, people can recognise the importance of non-formal educators and education. But I think uh, it's a long journey and sometimes it can supplement and complement your own creative practice, but you've got to be really careful with it. I think that's a very valid point because you burn out very quickly. You burn out, yeah. I mean, the, the thing about formal and non-formal thing is like formal uh, allows a kind of a set structure and also you know what pe governments giving out grants and things like that they have to know they have to be answerable to mm. the electorate whatever to say okay we're gonna we're gonna give it to this person here who's got a degree in blah 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 and you know this person here and this person here and then they're all gonna give these courses but that's got nothing to do with real life that's their that's academia um what i'm doing is real life practical stuff for the person involved in the music and i'll use whatever method if, if i felt teaching me teaching them how to read music was the way forward for them that's the way we would go okay. so i just i i don't think you some people think oh theory of music you know it's rubbish it's not rubbish there's a lot of people who have sweated over the years to give us this information you know and uh it's very it's a very useful tool to ha be able to call on that when you're going through a songwriting problem. Even just music, to be able to communicate with other musicians, yeah. uh, I think it's a brilliant ability. I wouldn't discredit it. I, I, the more I know about music, the more I want to know. And part yeah. of that is it's a key that'll unlock a lot yeah. of mysteries if you can understand, particularly if you're a lead guitarist, if you can understand theory, 
It, yeah, but you you got you got to also know as a creative person, like we're both teachers, we're natural mm -hmm. teachers. Um, you can't teach someone how to teach. You either are a teacher, mm -hmm. or you're not. If okay. like we've all been experienced in school with, um, you know, people who have gone to the teaching college and they come out and they couldn't teach to save their lives. Yeah. We okay. know that experience, and that's that could be very blunting on the on the the student, but. When you are a teacher, you have also got a responsibility. You have to accept it. And you have to just accept the fact that you're a good teacher. Like, I've seen you in action, great communicator. Like, you can't be taught that. No. That's innate. And, but what can be done is you can improve your game yourself and widen yeah. it and widen it and widen it. And, um, you know, then, like, that's invaluable. That's, you can't put a price on that. Yeah, it's funny, but you're even saying as a, as a musician or a creative, uh, the best way to study songwriting is listening to music, I think, and, and, and reading your favourite album lyrics. Yeah. And then read, you become obsessed. There's books like Paul Zollo's book, you know, Songwriters and Songwriting, which is really interesting. Yeah, There's right. others. But yeah. those kind of books, producers... I'm reading one on Brian Eno at the moment, which is interesting because you just yeah. see how their minds work. Yeah. And Eno's an interesting character because he has lots of other... Uh, creative practices. Yeah. As do you. You have other creative practices too. You do photography. Yeah. Don't you? And and video making. Yeah. Lots of different things. And I think for it, sometimes for creative people, it's good to have other practices or other. They all inform each other. Really yeah. At the end absolutely. Of the day. Isn't that true? Yeah. And tell us a couple of other questions. Quick questions. How do you nurture your creativity? Do you use technology, or not? Or well, I, I have this battle all the time because my wife says I'm addicted to the iPhone and I know I'm on the iPhone quite a lot mm -hmm. and it's very, it's very um, accessible and if I think a thought, then I want to research it and look it up. In the past, I've been look at a book, read a book, or I'd, I'd stop for a minute and think now I'm just going on and just trying to find out about it. And I'm actually going to stop that because I actually think it's detrimental to my memory and I think it's detrimental to, uh, you know, my sense of self because I, I, I tend to, I find myself feeling depersonalized when I'm on the internet, reading anything. You know, it's, it's a book. When I sit and read a book, I am able to take in stress-free the information in the book. If I read the book on a screen, it's something about it is not connecting with me. So I don't know why, this is only on a practical level I'm talking. So I don't know why it is. Uh, so I'm just gonna read more books now, less of the screen, but I'm not a little light. I have to be up in technology and what I do. But this whole crap about we're in a more connected world and all that, that is the greatest load of bullshit. Mm. When people are more lonely, more isolated than ever. And when I was a kid on the 20B bus coming back to Donny Carney in the mid eighties, uh, I picked up Time magazine. I was sitting there. I was reading it. Uh, in the 1990s, you know, we'd be in personal computer land, and we'd have all this, and uh, we won't need paper anymore because everything would be on the computer. Yeah. You know, there's more paper used now than I, ever. Like it's like the insurance industry, and we stop all this compensation claims and all that. The insurance premiums go down. No, they won't. They go up. Yeah, it's, it's like, like inverse it's, proportion. It doesn't something. work like that. But do you so, find that there's a tacticity of reading a book? It's kind of interesting. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I do like that. But also our, our imaginations. Yeah. Because if you're constantly reading on the internet, that's more and more minute or two minutes you could be doing something for yourself. Yeah, so I think it's having a healthy time. Plus you're always getting notifications and you ping and you ding and then you feel you have mm -hmm. to react. And Well, don't forget that's a reward thing that goes on the human thing we're all guilty of you know oh let's go on and see what that is but that's all cleverly worked out to manipulate is, yeah. for money you know so, so to be creative maybe is to stay away from some of it but use the technology as a tool that's that's yeah, what we use always technology have tool to record yeah. stuff and all that but yeah. to, if you really want to be creative um i think if you ask people honestly who are being mm. creative on a regular basis you need to have time out from surfing the web or on Facebook and all that crap, you know. I, I remember um, 
I only had two guitar lessons. Uh, the guy that was teaching me uh, was a real hippie guy, actually. He used to come around to combi and pull up at the house. And Camel the lessons Town. in Cameltown, yeah, where I grew up. Rob Hurst grew up there. I heard that, yeah. yeah. Uh, but they, this guy would show up and he'd make you do yoga All before right. I started playing guitar. Now, I'd never done yoga, but it was a couple of exercises to clear your mind. At the time, I thought, that's insane. But it was actually really clever because it made me take in, in those two guitar Very lessons, clever, yeah. the basics, and then off I went. But uh, it's really interesting. And sometimes, even before you, I think it's an interesting exercise because we find, okay, maybe I'd be interested to know what you think, but you go, I'm going to be creative. Between six and seven tonight, I've got an hour there yeah, from I've, my busy that schedule. Does work. It does, but I wonder, is it worth kind of de de-stressing and detoxing somehow giving yourself five minutes of just yeah. no time and then right let's go for it how different that approach is because would your work be better if you're writing lyrics or if you're strumming on the guitar do you, yeah. I don't know uh, look there's, there are basic truths uh, that have always been um, I did my first meditation course in 1994 in the Dublin Meditation Centre okay Buddhist Meditation and you know back then it was like you're doing what? How do you spell that? Meditation. And mindfulness, what's that? Yeah. So that was 94. So that's probably, what, 25 years ago? Now we have magazines talking about mindful meditation as if it's just dropped out of the sky. Um, all, the, all the real truths, like, you know, uh, I've been there forever. And... Like even playing the guitar, the biggest change to your tone you can make is the, is the way you hold the plectrum and your wrist. How you use your wrist on the guitar has a bigger effect on the tone than anything. I will believe it, yeah. I love the percussive style of playing yeah. and I think, yeah, you could really see it, it's it, all here. That's similar to tiny what you're saying, is, is like being really aware, just becoming aware of what's actually happening here, yeah. you know, what you're doing. And, and really, like, just speaking from yourself, speaking from your own soul and letting the world hear that. And if, if people are into it, they're into it, they're not into, not into it. People are busy. There's so much stuff on the internet. There's, there's loads of casual uh, amateur people clouding out the internet. There's loads of professional people clouding out the internet. There's loads of everything mm. out there. It's very hard to know what's going on. In the 80s, there were gatekeepers uh, you didn't get a record deal unless you were good, determined by certain people in the record company. Okay. You know, and then you got out and you were playing the radio and all that. That doesn't happen anymore. There's so, no gatekeepers anymore. So the only gatekeepers are people that you trust. So if you yeah. say, uh, I listen to this new band, mm -hmm. I'll go and listen to that new band because I trust your opinion and I know music that you like. And that's, that's what it's down to, it's reputation. And to bring that back down to teaching and creativity... Uh, it's about the reputation of the teacher, what the job the teacher's doing, how successful that teacher is at doing what they do. That yeah. gets the word around. Marketing is just bullshit. Like marketing, marketing is all over the place. And you know, what are your takeaways from this? And you know, at the end, you know, it's, it's just people are too intelligent for that to be taken in by marketing. But people will always listen to results from a friend. I want to learn how to play guitar. Do you know where I should go? Oh, yeah. You, know, you have to go to Peter Baxter because I'm telling you something. This guy is a legend and he will get you up and running. All right, I'm going. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, well, two more quick questions. One is collaboration. You mentioned before uh, Steve Kilby. And he's an interesting guy because he would have collaborated in lots yeah. of different things. But in terms of collaboration, how important is that in, in the creative sphere, do you think, for people? Uh, it's not for everyone, I don't think. But uh, I think for myself and Steve, like we're, we are both um, cut from the same cloth. So when we get together and play, we don't talk. I, I just close my eyes and, and the guitar just plays itself. And he just, he writes all the lyrics on the spot. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it so that? It's, it's, that's, when you get, when you get working with somebody like that, um, it transcends all the other stuff. You know? But you've collaborated with others. You've collaborated with Owen to write and oh, other yeah, people over the years. Yeah. So one of the things is sometimes people are stuck in their bedroom 
or their living room or yeah. whatever and they never get out. I think it's it's a brave step to make is to approach people, but you can control whether you continue it or not, but it's worth doing because you'd be amazed at what results come back. Yeah, absolutely. So, Once you respect the person you're working with and you're, yeah. you're at similar levels and all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, Imro used to do great weekends, actually. I remember going on some of those where you'd, you'd draw your name out of a hat and you'd yeah. find somebody in. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. Yeah, but of course, yeah. You don't know, you see, that could know. spark spark chemistry. Yeah, you know, absolutely. chemistry is everything. Yeah, because very often a lot of songs that we hear, we don't know necessarily who the writers are, but the writers, because we see the performer, if it was a hit maker... Christy Moore, yeah, Elvis, uh, you know, Frank Elvis Sinatra. Presley, yeah, sure. They didn't write that many songs. Sinead O'Connor. Well, they're probably like, best known for other songs. They're but, brilliant interpreters yeah. of, the, of the lyrics. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the music. Well, Christy writes some, but I know what you mean. Yeah, the majority of stuff maybe he'd be best known for would be yeah. other people's songs. And when you hear the original song, it's quite interesting to see yeah. how different it was. The likes of, say, Ride On, Jimmy McCarthy's original yeah, well, he, version. Yeah, he was into the bridge, Catch uh, Tony's song. Was he? Uh, or, yeah, like that song. I mean, I could definitely see Christy Moore covering the bridge. Wow. There's one. A, put know, a call in yeah definitely I, could, I don't know why it is I always imagined him singing that song yeah I don't know maybe he'd be yeah in a kind of right on way almost yeah there you go so Christy yeah. if you're listening Christy uh, if you're listening get Frank a ring call me toll free <laughs> uh, you were talking there about the, the Kilby uh, Speed of the Stars collaboration yeah. I love that album actually uh, one song in particular Black River yeah I love, it has to be played loud, uh, track number four. Yeah. It's our go-to song in the car. Great. And tell us a little bit about how that came about, because I'm going to play it if that's okay. Yeah, that's Finish cool. Up. Black River basically came about in, in when, we, when Steve came over to Ireland, we did the first sessions in the studio in 97. And uh, as you know, Steve got sick, mm -hmm. quotation marks, <laughs> at that time. So we didn't finish the album. And then what happened was uh, we... we um, Filed it away on the two inch tape. Uh, then fast forward into 2011, it's a fire in my house in Sutton. And uh, we had to get out and uh, salvage as much stuff as we could, put it into the uh, storage. And then in 2013, I went to the storage, the smell of smoke and everything. And I see these quarter inch tapes. And I go, that's from the, the sessions I did with Steve. And, I put them on, listened to them, and I, I went, I just got immediately onto them and said, we have to finish this. This is incredible. Wow. And, but there's no lyrics. <laughs> so, and then I went to Sydney in 2013, and 14, 15. So between the two, two of us, we, we, uh, we finished it. Black River is kind of like walking down, uh, you know, the early European explorers in Africa, Burton, and Livingston, Livingston and Livingston. Stanley and yeah, yeah these that's guys. what you hear at the end you hear them talking about Livingston oh right yeah it's all about that idea of yeah you know going into the unknown and yeah. uh, in an area where you really shouldn't be because it's beautiful it's really sparse and open I love the production on it too uh, that's it's interesting how a collaboration I think sometimes we also feel that uh, like for example if you think you're a writer and you write a book. A good yeah. book is timeless. And you're saying good music's timeless. It is. it is. But for sometimes with the creative process, we feel we have to keep going, keep going, keep going, not necessarily go back and visit old stuff. Oh, uh, how do you know when it's finished? Yeah. Uh, well, that, that's a good one because... Don't know. Uh, stick a fork in its ass and... <laughs> turn, <laughs> turn it on. Thanks, Lou, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, overcooking is probably the most common thing I see. And yeah. also, I'm guilty. Yeah. So... Uh, Overcooking is a result of perfectionism. Okay. And perfectionism is a result of someone not feeling they're good enough. And they don't feel, they feel if they don't make any mistakes and don't show any vulnerabilities, no one can point a finger at them. Okay. So that's where it comes back to. So the antidote to all that is not to say, oh, it doesn't matter, no standards. It's just to go for excellence. Don't go for perfection, go for excellence. 
Yeah, so. but it's a knowing that. In fact, uh, I think one of the other things is when years ago you had a studio for 24 hours or whatever, yeah. you were done when you were done, you were out, and that was yeah. it, lads. Make do. It's That's hard when you need when a producer. You need a producer, yeah. And just to finish up then, Frank, and thank yep. you for your time, sir, uh, we are going to play Black River, but tell us any tips or advice out there for someone's getting started on their creative journey. Uh, any any nuggets? I would get the, sit down, get a blank piece of paper, write down what inspired you in music. Write down. It could be like for me. Uh, I'll give you an example. Achilles' Last Heel, uh, Led Zeppelin. Mm-hmm. Uh, I could listen to that song when I heard the song first. It, I didn't reconnect it, and then towards the end of it, there's this kind of loop effect on the guitar. That inspires me. I could be inspired by two seconds of a chord change or a mood that I hear, you know? That's where I come in in music, that's my angle. But yours could be Bob Dylan lyrics, it could be whatever. You yeah. have to find out, write it down, and then look at it. Look at it on a sheet of paper and go, okay, I'd love to be able to do something like this. How would I do this? Well, I just need a acoustic guitar, or okay. I need electric guitar and some effects, or a piano. Or find out how they did whatever it is, but it, it could just be a change or a sound yeah, or yeah, a tone. Yeah, and sometimes or... your approximation of what they're doing mm. creates something new. Yeah. So I would stay away from YouTube as much as possible. Uh, I'll let your imagination run. Because if you do what everyone else does, you're going to get what everyone else gets, you know? Uh, and, you know, if, if you're influenced by a band, like, say, Chili Peppers... Don't listen, listen, don't listen to Chili Peppers. Listen to what the Chili Peppers listen to. Yeah, go back to Flash. the source. Go yeah. back to the source and take your bit from it. Yeah. And that way, when you come out with your stuff, it'll all be sound fresher. Great advice. And that's, that's what I would do. So. Well, cheers. Thank you so much, Frank. You're welcome. <laughs>
But nothing ever dies, no, it's just the years going by. Nothing.